If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and attempt the question on your own before moving on. Our first step, of course, is to draw a picture of the arrangement of charges. Now, in part A, in order to calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force on particle 2 due to particle 1, we're going to have to use Coulomb's law. Now, of course, in Coulomb's law, we multiply the magnitude of the charges by the Coulomb constant and then divide by the distance between the charges squared. We've denoted that distance r sub 1, 2. So our first step would be to find the distance between the two charges. And to do that, we can use, of course, the distance formula. This is a formula you probably learned back in algebra. So, of course, all we need to do is plug in the x-coordinates and the y-coordinates of the two charges. So here the coordinates have been plugged in, and when you simplify that, you should get approximately 0.056 meters. So that will serve as the distance between the two particles. We are now ready to plug into Coulomb's law to get the magnitude of the force. So just a couple things to notice. Here is the distance that we just calculated. The value of k is this constant 8.99 times 10 to the 9th, of course. Also notice that we converted the charges into coulombs by multiplying them by 10 to the minus 6. So for example, q1 was reported as 3 microcoulombs. We have to make sure we multiply that by 10 to the minus 6 to convert it into coulombs. And when we compute this, we get approximately 35 newtons, and that will represent the magnitude of the force that's acting on particle 2. And as for the direction of this force that's acting on charge 2, we'll want to take note that because charge 2 is negative and charge 1 is positive, there will be an attractive force. And so charge 2 is being pulled towards charge 1. And we've shown that attractive force with this red vector that's pointing towards Q1. And basically what we can do is form a right triangle between the charges. And, and then we'll note that the distance from here all the way to here could be determined by just reading off the x-axis. We know from here is 1, 2, and then 3, 4, 5, and a half. So that distance is 5 and a half. And then this distance here would actually be just 1. And if that's not clear from the picture, remember that y1, the y-coordinate on charge 1 was 0.5 centimeters. The y-coordinate on the other charge is 1.5 centimeters. So the difference between them would just be 1 centimeter. Now with that right triangle drawn and labeled, we can try to find this angle right here. We'll call it theta, and of course we can use the tangent function because we have the opposite side of theta as well as the adjacent side. And then when we take the inverse tangent, we get approximately 10 degrees for that angle. And then notice from the figure that if we extended this line just a little more so we can see it, that's essentially the positive x-axis. So we can say 10 degrees below the positive x-axis. And that indeed is the correct answer for the angle. Now, for part C and D, we'll first want to notice that the third charge, Q3, has to be placed collinear with the Q1 and Q2. And it has to be placed on the left side of Q2. And the reason for that is that the attractive force between Q2 and Q3 would be pointing in this direction. And that would be balanced by the attractive force between Q1 and Q2, which points in the opposite direction. So the idea is that those two attractive forces will cancel each other out, and that would produce a net force of zero acting on charge two, which is exactly what we want in this question. Now let's call this force right here F23. And then this force, we can denote again F21. That's the force we found in part A of the question. Again, these two forces have to be equal to one another. So we'll go ahead and set them equal to each other. So here are the two expressions of the Coulomb's forces set equal to each other. We want to take note of what we mean by R. Now, of course, that's going to be the distance between charge number 2 and charge number 3. So in the diagram, that would be this distance right here. So that we're just going to let that distance equal R. And actually, we're going to take this equation right here and see if we can solve for R. We'll notice that Q2 appears on both sides of the equation, so that can be canceled out. K can also be canceled from the equation. Let's then multiply both sides of the equation by r squared so that it cancels out on the left side. And then, of course, multiply both sides by r12 squared so it cancels out on the right side. And then divide both sides by q1. And then to finish off solving for r, we'll just square root both sides. And now we can plug in the known values. Recall that Q3 and Q1 are both given in the question, and then R sub 1, 2 was that distance we had found earlier between charge 2 and charge 1. 
And when you compute this down, you should get approximately 0 0.0647, and that would be in meters. We're going to find it helpful to convert that to centimeters, so we just multiply by 100, and we get approximately 6.47 centimeters. And that's going to represent the distance that we labeled R in the diagram over here. Now let's recall that we had found an angle of 10 degrees right there that we found earlier as being 10 degrees, which means that an angle right here would also be 10 degrees. Now of course through trigonometry we know that the adjacent side right here would be the R times the cosine of the 10 degrees, and then this opposite side would be R times the sine of 10 degrees. Now since we have the value of R as 6.47 centimeters, we can plug that in here and here, and that's going to give us the adjacent side length and the opposite side length. And when we do that, the adjacent side turns out to be 6.37 and the opposite side is 1.12. That's going to help us find the actual coordinates of this charge. Remember, that's our goal right now. This is charge Q3. We need the X and Y coordinates. Well, we know the X and Y coordinates of this negative charge here. That was Q2 and that was given to us as negative 2 comma 1.5. So we know the coordinates there are negative 2 comma 1.5. Well, to go from charge Q2 over to charge Q3, we just have to move backwards along the x-axis. So essentially what we're going to do is subtract the 6.37 from this x-coordinate. So the x-coordinate is going to become the negative 2 of charge Q2 minus the 6.37 that we just found. So we're going to get approximately negative 8.37 for the x-coordinate. And then the y-coordinate, all we need to do is move upward along the y-axis to get to Q3. And we're going to move upward by this much, 1.12. So we'll take the y-coordinate of Q2 and add to it the 1.12 centimeters that we just found. And we get approximately 2.62 centimeters. So that would represent the x and y coordinates of Q3. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video. If you liked it, please subscribe to the channel so you can stay tuned for additional videos. Also, you are welcome to send in your own question to the email address shown on the screen.